and welcome to the Flick List. Uh, we have made our list. The question is, have you made yours? Well, if not, that's okay because I'm sure <laughs> we're going to have plenty to talk about here today on the mm -hmm. Flick List. Uh, I am Drew, and over here uh, we have my uh, co pilot in the uh, Flick List co pilot chair, Erin. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. She is the assistant manager. Is that the correct title? Yes. Assistant manager at Marcus Cinema in La Crosse. I am. So uh, if you're wondering what her pedigree is, uh, I have none because I don't work at a theater. I just like <laughs> movies. So we'll just get that out of the way here from the get-go. So how are yeah. you doing? Pretty good. Yeah. I got recognized actually from this. Really? At the theater. And I was get like... Get out! Hi. <laughs> what, what, what exactly did they say? Um, they were just like, hi, Aaron. And I'm like, hi. And I'm like... <laughs> I was just like, I have no idea what's going on. He's like, oh, no, no, no. I watch your show. The one with Drew. <laughs> I was like... Complete stranger? Wow. Not, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's like, oh, hi. Oh. I'm going to go into an office now. <laughs> yeah. So that YouTube algorithm actually yeah, works. I guess. Apparently. Yeah. So, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, we've, we're, we're up to, I think we're up to tens of viewers now. Wow. Yeah, that's... Something to, is that something to, is that something to celebrate? <laughs> I really have no idea. I think every single every milestone si yeah. on YouTube is Well, we are our last episode was almost double the first one. Nice. But in fair enough, I didn't share the first one a lot cuz it was kind of an experiment. <laughs> and yeah, so the the sharer the better the better -er. The more the sharier, yes. yeah, if you know what That's I mean. That's how algorithms work. Uh, yes, and uh, like buttons on the bottom of our, if you're watching this on mm -hmm. YouTube, there's a little thumbs up if you click that. That helps too. So, uh, yeah, we got quite a few of those also. Nice. So this is pretty good. Um, yes, <laughs> on to, uh, oh yeah, we have lists to talk about mm -hmm. today. Uh, we're, this is in, we were talking a little bit about a movie I got in the mail yesterday, and you asked me if it was an anniversary film, and mm -hmm. I said no, but... <laughs> we are going to talk about some anniversaries today. Uh, the 40th anniversary of a lot of movies today because we're going to talk about the year of 1982. Mm -hmm. 40 years of which. Yep. And these are, I think it's quite safe to say that these movies have stood the test of time rather well. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of good movies on here. I, <laughs> I will admit, there's a lot of good movies on here, but not a lot of them are my favorite. So this list for me was really hard to yeah. just... And this is made, it would it be fair from, to would it be fair to say that a lot of movies on these what what we're going to talk today are before your time a little bit? Uh yes. Uh this, this is the year before I was born. So okay. <laughs> now everyone knows. No. <laughs> Words out, sorry. Mm. Yeah. Just wait till next year. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to wait till next year. It's just a number. I know. It really is. I know. But, uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, in case you are a new here to the flick list, uh, how it works is uh, Aaron and I both come up with a list of five films. Mm -hmm. uh, when we started doing the show, we didn't share our lists, but because we kind of wanted them to be a surprise. But then we thought maybe we should share our list ahead of yeah. time so we can have a little, few more interesting things to say if mm -hmm. if you have more interesting things to say about them. So between the two of us, we have a list of 10 films we will talk about here today, uh, representing the year, or the class of 1982. Yep. So, and uh, I'm going to make, I have a little bit of a spoiler alert here, kind of, but not really, but I think we're going to have to, I'm going to have to need a little room at the end for some honorable mentions, because okay. there's a lot of great movies from the, I could only pick five, mm -hmm. and I'm going to have to go through the ones that just <laughs> didn't quite make the cut. Okay. So, all right. Uh, we're going to start off with Aaron's number five pick <laughs> from 1982. From 1982. My number five pick, I went with uh, 1001 Rabbit's Tales, oh. a compilation of Looney Tunes cartoons. Yeah. Like I said, there was a lot of movies on this list, but not really a lot that either I have not seen them all, mm -hmm. like Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. <laughs> Which that, I hear is an amazing movie, but I have not seen Dolly it. That's Dolly Parton, yes? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Burt Reynolds? Yes. 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 I think they're both in that, yep. Mm -hmm. Which would have been on my list, but because it's a musical and that's just what I do. But I haven't seen it, so I couldn't put it on my list. So I had to sneak off a couple of them. But one that I have seen, that I have fond memories of, is A Thousand One Rabbit's Tales, where Yosemite Sam is a sultan and... Uh, Bugs Bunny has to read his kids' stories 
as his very own Shahrazad. And then they just replay a bunch of Looney Tunes cartoons. Yeah. <laughs> this was uh and this was kind of a a trend I mean this was kind of a 1882 is a weird year be, because this was kind of like not quite before I guess there was technically home video at this time mm -hmm. but it wasn't really as like it, what it would become right yeah they were the machines were more expensive yeah. to have uh there weren't as many rental places was, Those, was this in the middle of the the Betamax wars oh uh, yes uh, um, very much so in like fact I said, before my time i am old enough to remember going in to video stores mm -hmm. and seeing both vhs and a vhs section and a Betamax section. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that's not all I saw behind that curtain in the video store. Um, <laughs> it's um, like, did you see the reason why VHS went out? Let's not go there. No. <laughs> uh, do we have a studio audience in here? I guess I, I don't think we do. Um, if we don't they are, the, they're very small and or invisible. Yeah, they're, 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 we don't have the budget. Um, <laughs> There's a duck. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't quack though. No. Um, but this, yeah, but it was very. I think it was more common for not so much with adult films, but like animated films, mm -hmm. especially something like Looney Tunes, to be kind of cobbled together to put on a big screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something easy for, you know, hey, I got to go shopping at the mall for an hour because we're, I need a dress and mm -hmm. we're out of groceries. Here, I'll drop the brats off at the theater and they can watch Looney Tunes for an hour and a half. Boom. Problem solved. People still do that. Yeah. <laughs> but they still do that. <laughs> Disney. Mm -hmm. Disney stuff. Sonic well, Hedgehog. not so much like little kids, but people, uh, parents of teenagers will just be like, here, go watch a movie. Oh, you're talking about teenagers now. Oh, see, I see what you're doing. It, it has to be teenagers now because if a, you know, 10 or under year old child comes into the theater, I go, where are your parents? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you should not be here alone. <laughs> no, they should not. Oh, well, my parents wouldn't let me do that. Not without somebody watching mm -hmm. us. So, Although, uh, for another episode, I might have another story about that. But <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, but, there was, but this was kind of a trend with... Uh, Specifically with Looney Tunes, because there were two other movies before this that I think had the same formula. Mm. There was the Bugs Bunny slash Road Runner movie, mm -hmm. which came out I think in '79, and then I think before this it was the Looney 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 Bugs Bunny movie. Nice. Which also was a compilation. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one where Yosemite Sam goes to hell. And then he's like having like, oh no, I did this thing. And then there was, it's kind of like the cartoon equivalent of like the flashback episode mm -hmm. in a sitcom mm -hmm. where Yosemite Sam was, you might have to correct me on this. He was going to hell. He's yeah. greeted by the, so you were naughty, a guy, gatekeeper person with the huge trident pitchfork, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he says, no, no, no. And then there's like all these different Looney Tunes, previous Looney Tunes that he that are kind of in between him uh -huh. making making his case kind of thing, and they kind of make a mov vignette mini movie yeah. around them. Like kind of thing. Uh, this is your life. Yeah, your yeah, Sam that's Sam exactly thing. what it was. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Looney Tunes character that other than Bugs Ooh. Bunny? Character? Yeah. Uh, uh, Any and all. Uh, no, I'm on the spot. Um, I like Taz. Yeah, Taz uh, is alright. He's all right. fun. I like the Road Runner. Yeah. Because I the do runner like doesn't Daffy. Pop Daffy, yeah. I'm partial to Marvin the Martian. Oh yeah. Yeah. I used to have a Marvin the Martian T-shirt. I got it at Comic Con years ago, That's... but I wore it. It's all got holes in it, and I unwearable now. So. Oh no. <laughs> oh well. There's always print shops online that can make you a new one. So. That is true. All right. Uh, anything else? No. No. Okay. All right. So I guess it's time for my number five selection. Oh uh, man. This was tough. Um, but you kept I, saying. Yeah. I, uh, and, and then flipping back and forth I, between the I was I was flipping back and forth before a half hour before this show went on the air. <laughs> Still? Still. Man. I could just like, man, should I? Shouldn't I? I don't know. But anyway, in number five, I'm going to go with Blade Runner. Ridley Scott's 1982 Blade. I mean, wow. It's just... 
I, this is one that was really unbelievable because there's some. Uh, there's another one I was really wrestling you with, what I'll get to <laughs> later. But I went with Blade Runner. Um, yeah, this was came up. This, if anybody knows anything about Blade Runner, people, even if they haven't seen this movie, probably think they've seen this movie mm -hmm. because it's been. You can see Blade Runner in so many different things. Um, uh, we did a show. Last time on uh, animated feature, uh, non-Disney animated movies, mm -hmm. I talked about Ghost in the Shell. That's influenced by Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. um, the Matrix, Blade Runner. Um, I know there's a, there's a movie called Dark City that's influenced mm -hmm. by Blade Runner. You can see Blade Runner in so many different things. Even in the Star Wars prequels, uh, I think Attack of the Clones are basically doing a high-speed chase through a Blade Runner-ish type of mm -hmm. town. Or futurist futuristic type of thing so but uh yeah it's basically about where humanity is at it's like it's a there's it seems to be two different types of science fiction there's utopian mm -hmm. and then there's dystopian mm -hmm. where things are going really well things are getting worse and this is kind of the dystopian part where like you know it's raining all the time it's dirty uh, and uh, we have found a way to deal with a labor shortage is that we can just make human beings to do the work for us. Don't we do that now? Oh, you mean actually make Actually human. create yeah. hu humans. Uh. And they're referred to as replicants. Mm -hmm. um, and to, they, to do work off world. This is why I think I might have mentioned this before, but this is a movie that could have taken place like the, because they're directed by the same guy, Alien. Mm -hmm. And Blade Runner could have been in the same. It's never, it's never been officially put that way, especially since they were, were done by two different studios, but they mm -hmm. have the same director mm -hmm. because they involve. Alien also involves a, pl a subplot where they're one of the crew that they don't realize is a artificial person, mm -hmm. whereas here they actually manufacture the artificial people. Do the artificial people in Blade Runner bleed white? Um, you know, I don't know if they do. Hmm. I don't know if they, hmm. that's a good question. But, well, that's kind of, well, hmm. anyway. And then there's a third movie, which is unrelated to this, which I thought could have been in this universe as well. It's a Sean Connery film called Outland. Hmm. If, you, if you watch it, I mean, the production design, it, it looks like it could be in the same universe as Blade hmm. Runner, or Alien for that matter. Uh, it's about uh, a drug smuggling ring on the moons of Jupiter. Yeah, because they're far away from the police, don't you know? Supposedly. That is, that is pretty far away from the Yeah, police. well, that's why Sean Connery comes to town, because he's got to bust him up. Yeah, of course. course. But, um, that's what he does. But anyway, yeah. um, these uh, replicants are designed to last, I think, four or five years. And uh, there's some of them there where they weren't, there is some defect in their creation, and they go kind of crazy and kill some people. Because they're mad, and they want to know why they can't live longer. They want more life. Mm. And it's kind of Harrison Ford's job. He doesn't, he's not given that information. He just knows that people have been killed by replicants. It's his job to figure out who they are mm -hmm. and go eliminate them. Mm. But then he kind of, you know, it's kind of a real interesting film. And uh, the cinematography is fantastic. Oh. Production design is amazing. And it's kind of a miracle this movie even made it to the screen because there was a lot of dissatisfaction between director and crew mm -hmm. at this time uh, because uh, they kind of resented, or the crew was American and Ridley Scott being a uh, Brit uh, maybe ran things a little differently than mm -hmm. they're accustomed to. Uh, and Harrison Ford didn't get along with them either. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's a huge documentary. If you get the Blu-rays, or I don't know if this is on 4K yet or not, but I don't think it is. But it will be. I, mm -hmm. I almost guarantee it. Like but, if it's not, it will but be. But if it's not, there is a feature-length documentary called Dangerous Days, just about the making of this film. Wow. And in the interview, oh, man. Everybody. Tons of people that from behind the scenes to in front of the camera to critics whatever it's just fantastic and um the big thing i think quentin tarantino might have stolen this for pulp fiction is like they don't know whether or not the big thing is you're supposed to figure out if harrison ford is actually a replicant or not mm -hmm. and so 
Yeah, that's uh, Blade Runner. I could talk about this probably for the entire yeah. hour, but <laughs> I got to move on. So, all right, this is time for Aaron's number four pick. Oh, so many choices. Let's see. I am gonna go. Number four is gonna be Grease Two. Hmm. Curious. Like well, you, said, well, you hit musicals. the music, the musical yep. mark. Yeah. Musicals and. Honestly, between the first Grease and Grease 2, Grease 2 is my favorite. Um, it <laughs> you you prefer this, Grease 2 to the first one? Yeah. Why? Yeah, just, I'm, not, songs, I'm not trying to bust your chops. I just cur- genuinely... Because this, from all, all I've been able to glean about this film, mm-hmm. is that it's not exactly beloved compared to to the first film. That in is, fact, it's kind of, wouldn't you say it's kind of reviled a bit? Like people hate it? The people who love I, the first film don't like this one at all? I honestly don't know because like okay. coming, that's not coming that, from the circle of people who like this movie. <laughs> so you knew, so, okay. So you are the circle, well, sort of? Me, my sister, some of my friends who have gotten to listen to it. See, the thing with Grease 2 is yes, that please. it is very much... Um, it's it's almost like poking fun at the original one, whereas like the original one was a musical in the se- in the seventies that was set in the fifties. Mm-hmm. So this is a musical in the eight, from the eighties, set in the sixties, seventies, sixties, somewhere around there, in the Cold War, and pe- people were afraid that nukes were gonna fall on us. Right. Whenever that time was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But because it, they aren't taking themselves seriously, and it just you can you can see that in it is that it's just kind of this tongue in cheek the whole movie. It's ridiculous. A <laughs> nerd is trying to win over um, the cool girl, so he goes and buys a motorcycle, oh, a yeah, broken that, motorcycle, that. fixes it up, becomes a motorcycle rider, but like doesn't tell anybody that he does. And then, like, so she's in love with this mysterious motorcycle guy. But he also still pretends to be the nerd. Hmm. And, like... So a, a, a dual identity. Yeah, very much a dual identity. And then he dies, but he doesn't die. And then there's a sad song about that. But it, all the songs are ridiculous. And Is the song the leader of the pack? No. No? Oh, nope. Okay. Nope. <laughs> it... Oh, I'm trying, I, trying really hard to figure out how to explain. There is a weird dream sequence in the middle of a, of a show pageant that actually takes place in real life because she's actually singing and wins the competition with this song that she was singing in her dream sequence. This is how ridiculous this movie is. Wow. Yes. But it's still one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite musicals. Because it's it's crazy. I I like things silly. What can I say? Yeah. And the the two leads are Michelle Pfeiffer and Maxwell Caulfield, um, who later went on to be Rex uh, Rex Manning in Empire Records. Oh yeah, that's where I. So seen if him anybody, <laughs> yeah. If anybody is wishing you a happy Rex Manning day, the the that guy. <laughs> Same guy from Grease 2. And it's ridiculous. I was thinking I'd seen... I didn't recognize the name, but he looked familiar. Like, I'd mm-hmm. seen him somewhere before. And can I also make an, an, another observation? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's quite amazing that Michelle Pfeiffer went on to have the career that she does. Because mm-hmm. usually when you start your career with something that bombs as bad as Grease 2 does, <laughs> you, you know, it, you don't go so... Yeah. You don't do so hot, but somehow she managed to outlive it. She, she found some some better roles. Yeah, I or guess so. Equivalent roles, because yeah. this is the best role. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Or uh, sleeping with the producer probably helps too. So, <laughs> Jesus. Um, well, for she's actually she's married to a, a producer, um, David E. Kelly, okay. who was, I don't know about back then if she was married to him, but he's responsible for a lot of TV like uh, Boston Legal mm-hmm. and. Um, some other stuff I can't remember. Some a lot of legal drama kind of shows those kind of things. So, uh, all right, yeah. that's uh, Grease Two. Mm-hmm. All right, no Travolta to be found though. 
Nope. Oh, well. And it's a better movie for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Frenchie's still in it. That's true. That's true. <laughs> All right. Uh, my number four selection. Um, this was a little tough, but um, I decided to go with John Carpenter's The Thing. Mm. Uh, which in 1982 was not exactly lighting the box office on fire. Which is weird because much like Blade Runner, it became more appreciated as time went on. I think what I would, at the time there was, of course, E.T. was the big movie of that year. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody like, oh, the alien, he's friendly, he's cute and cuddly, you know, he wants to go back home, uh, E.T. phone home and all that. Mm -hmm. And nobody wanted uh, aliens that like mimicked humans and like, not just humans, but other life forms, and were kind of gory looking, yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. That was a little bit off-putting back then, but in a sense, that's kind of been appreciated. Like probably one of the best remakes ever made um, for any kind of movie. Uh, well, basically, what it boils down is re- there was a previous film called uh, in 1951 called The Thing from Another World, mm-hmm. uh, which actually the, the creature from that film was played by James Arness, who went to be a, on to be a big deal in the TV series Gunsmoke, mm-hmm. if you can believe that. But uh, um, and that was it, it wasn't really sp- anything special about the creature from then. It's just an alien that was sneaking around in mm-hmm. uh, Ar- Antarctica. Uh, scare, for scaring a bunch of uh, people working at a military base down there. Well, this time, uh, there's also men at a research station, uh, Outpost 31, I think it's called. And uh, all of a sudden, a Malamute or a Siberian Husky or some one of those kind of dogs shows up. I'm like, oh, isn't this nice? But, but the uh, problem is that they, the dog was chased there by a helicopter from a Norwegian outpost mm-hmm. and they were trying to kill it. And they're like, oh, God, why are they shooting a dog for it? Mm-hmm. Is, they couldn't figure out why. And then, well, after that it becomes very apparent why that dog was bad news. So, uh, yeah, and then this thing uh, has the ability to like change itself into other members of this uh, outpost and people don't know who's who mm-hmm. and all that kind of thing and yeah it's a, it really in there's like I know there were entire websites dedicating to like showing why different members of this crew could have been the thing at any point during the mm-hmm. movie and it's interesting to like read all those theories I'm like wow you know what that's actually a really good case uh, but yeah, it's an interesting cast. Of course, <laughs> Kurt Russell is the, probably the big star of the movie. But then you have a lot of up-and-comers and then like an established old farts like Wilford Brimley. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the Quaker oatmeal guy for <laughs> years. Eat your oatmeal. You know, and he's got like credits <clears throat> as long as your arm, but he's probably most, to most people, he's probably well known for a couple things. The Quaker oatmeal guy mm-hmm. or having... Diabetes, because <laughs> he was, he was the spokesperson for this. How was it like medical supply yeah, company like, or something? Yeah. yeah, or something. Something. Yeah, and then uh, they had you had Richard Dysart who played the the surgeon. He he became a big deal a few years after this on a show called L.A. Law. Mm-hmm. If you remember L.A. Law, I remember. Yeah, LA he Law. was like the head of the that law firm on that show. Um, who else is in there? And then a lot of guys who didn't really go on to do a ton of stuff after Mm -hmm. this. And, um, yeah, it's just, if if you don't like gory movies, this probably isn't going to be for you. But uh, my favorite thing in this movie is probably the blood test Mm -hmm. scene where they have everybody, like, bleed into these Petri cups and they find out, okay, if it's you. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they find out who it is and... The guy starts changing, and all the other guys are tied up and trying to get away from the thing, and they can't do it. And they're like, "Ah!" It's just crazy. But uh, yeah, it's John Carpenter. I think I can't really say this is John Carpenter's number one film. That I have to give to Halloween. Mm. But this has definitely got to be number two for me, anyway. But yeah, it's a, if you've never seen it and you're like a good scare. 
especially during the winter time. Yeah. Throw this in and have a blast. I would say so. <laughs> so yeah, the thing is my number four film. Whew. Whew. Yeah. Should we check your blood next to see if you're real? <laughs> All right. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> time for Aaron's number four <clears throat> film. Three. Three film. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm sorry. My number three film. I am going to go with The Dark Crystal. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have seen this. Yeah. Mm. So, the <laughs> best character. What was that lady's name? That was the Chamberlain. Mm. Yeah. Mm. He's Skeksis. He's just like, mm. Mm. Yeah. and best character, even though he is the villain. Would it be say, um, it's almost like the Muppet equivalent of the Harvey Corman character in Blazing Saddles. Because he always said, after the governor said anything, mm -hmm. he would basically repeat it and say the word splendid after it. I think we're going to invade Rock Ridge. Mm, Rock Ridge, splendid, splendid. <laughs> mm, yes. 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 Yeah. I, I, yeah. So the, the, was... is, this is like the Muppet equivalent of Harvey, Harvey Corman, yeah. yeah. I guess you could say that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, plot. Plot. Um, the, they need to go find this dark crystal. They, they need to find the shard of the dark crystal. Yep. Um, uh, I am going to get all character names wrong because even though this is on my list, I don't remember anything except Chamberlain. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't even remember what the, the guys were called. There are, two, there are two creature races. There are the Skeksis who look like weird vulture bird things. And, and then there are the, there's the Gelflings yeah. who are the little pod people. Um, and then there's the other group that are like the yin to the Skeksis yang, literally. Um, but I don't remember what those what about the little were called. The fuzz, fizzwit? F fizz, yeah, what, that thing. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it basically these two uh, races are slowly die dying out and they're trying to figure out why and they f think it has something to do with the dark crystal that has been taken over by the Skeksis. And so main yak man, they kind of look like yaks, kind of <laughs> bipedal yaks, um, sends yes. main character, I'm really good at names, on this quest mm. and... For some reason I want to say Jed, but I don't think that's right. I want, now that you say that, I want to say Ged. Or maybe it's Ged. G-E-D. Something with G -E -D. a J. G, G, -E -D. J or a G. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The people are yelling at the <laughs> yep. TV right now. I'm really sorry. Yeah. He I, goes I, on I, this quest. I have, it's been a while since I've seen it, but I, did, I have seen it quite a few years ago. I, I wanted to watch it for this show, but mm -hmm. I couldn't find anywhere where I could stream it Yeah. without it paying for it. It is a hard one to find right now, which doesn't make any sense because it is the anniversary. <laughs> it's like, come on, put it in, th put it in theaters. Yeah, needs we a 4K. We have so many yeah. anniversary movies coming in. Put in the Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will watch that. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, it's very much a, a hero journey movie um, with wonderful Muppets and, and creatures done yeah. by Henson. Yeah. And. See, I, I know you're a big fan of Labyrinth, but I prefer mm -hmm. Dark Crystal to Labyrinth. Yeah, I like that's just Labyrinth my opinion. More, but yeah. I, I do, I really just love everything from the the creature department. Of, yeah, of and it was produced by Gary Kurtz, mm -hmm. who uh, was a producer on the the first two Star Wars films. Nice, so, yeah. nice. So, yeah, I know that a lot of the actual uh, creature designs were done by the. Frouds, F R O U D Frouds, um, who are a buried couple, and I know that Mrs. Froud, I want to call her Wendy, but that probably is wrong, um, put out a build your own or sculpt your own fairy video, mm. and I actually I I watched it, I followed along, and that got me on a sculpting track, and I have a lot of different sculptures that look much like hers. Oh, well, here's a zinger <laughs> for you. Do you have an opinion on the Dark Crystal series? 
only that I know that I'm supposed to watch it because uh, there's somebody doing a voice in it that I appreciate. Mark Hamill? But I have not seen it yet. Okay. Interesting. All right. I don't know. They only made, like, what, was it six episodes? Yeah. It wasn't a long series. No. I no. feel like it got canceled right away because it was expensive. Yeah. <laughs> As like, yeah. as all most expensive things do, even if they're good. So, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. All right. Uh, are we on the threes now? Yep, we're on three. Wow. I guess it's time for my number three selection. Uh, I'm gonna go with the movie that uh, Blade Runner and the Thing get tend to get a lot of appreciation now than they did then. And I'm going to put in another movie that is was underappreciated then and I still think is underappreciated. It's called Tron. Uh, it was actually made by Disney back in 1982 when <laughs> Disney, you know, it's funny that when you talk to younger people now, Disney now ain't what it was back then. In fact, it was kind of the opposite. They were, Disney was hurting big back then um, because they didn't have a lot of a lot of they tried some different things but they weren't really didn't really come up they had a weird period they had a very weird well in the late late 70s early 80s they had a very strange slate of movies and like in between there they would they would like well much like the Bugs Bunny stuff Mm -hmm. they would reissue a lot of older because home video wasn't a thing yet Mm -hmm. they would reissue a lot of older movies like Snow White and um um, Cinderella mm-hmm. and Bambi and things yeah. like that. I know because I went to a few of those as a kid. Um, but then you had they put out things like The Black Hole, which is a bold mm-hmm. move for them, or Watcher in the Woods, or um, what's this other one I was thinking of? Uh, oh, uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Uh, yeah. Ray Bradbury, mm-hmm. they did that. Um, and then they did Tron, which was quite a... It's funny because... It paved the way for a lot of stuff, but you didn't see anything that looked like Tron before. Mm-hmm. And you didn't really see it afterwards because it changed a lot. Mm-hmm. But it did influence a lot of stuff. And even like the guy who eventually ended up running Pixar, I think, said, hey, I don't think there would be Pixar without Tron. Mm-hmm. You know. But anyway, um, mm-hmm. it, the movie Tron, it starts out, Jeff Bridges is the main character in the movie. And he is a computer programmer slash arcade owner because that's how he makes his money he runs an arcade and he makes works in computers and he had some stuff stolen by his boss allegedly mm-hmm. uh, and then the boss used that information to like make himself like the president of this company and all this other it's industrial espionage and all this other stuff and he wants to get it back hmm. so uh, he has like some friends who kind of help him out with that a little bit and can get him back in the building because, you know, he's fired and he has no access and all this other stuff. This was before you were able to uh, work from home, you know, right. just kind of dial right. in. Back then you actually had to physically go into a workplace and work <laughs> on a computer. <laughs> but uh, there's this powerful computer who ch- controls everything called the MCP, or Master Control Program. Mm-hmm. And if you stop and think about it, the MCP is basically, you know, it's one of... Or the earlier examples, I think, in films where there's uh, as as a computer with sentience. Mm-hmm. You know, this was because a little bit before Skynet and the Terminator movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there were a couple of examples before this too. But I mean, it's like this is a computer that wants yeah. to go out and reach out and control the room. And oddly enough, uh, Superman three is kind of a movie like that because it's if you stop thinking about it as a Superman movie, which is hard not to because it's the title. <laughs> It actually is a weird movie mm-hmm. about predicting the future and what computers were going to do. And mm-hmm. it's just, even though it's not a particularly good movie in air quotes, but anyway, uh, this master control program sucks Jeff Bridges into the computer by kind of like taking him apart and reassembling him and blah, blah, blah. And he basically becomes a character in a video game simulation world. And he's trying to get to the MCP to basically just, you know, take it down so he can find this information in the computer graphics. I mean, of course, they look dated today, but I mean, they look—they look so cool. Mm-hmm. I think. I mean, for the time, and and you just don't really see that anything like that anywhere else. I mean, and I'm sure I've mentioned this on other episodes too. But if something gets parodied by South Park, mm-hmm. 
you had to know it was a pretty big deal at mm-hmm. some point. And there is a there is a Tron parody episode of South Park. Nice. I forget the title of it. I want to say it's called You Have Zero Friends or something like that. But um, sounds right. Yeah. But I uh, could not delete it. Uh, it's it's head. in there. It's in there. Uh, but it, yeah. So and also, you have a couple of other interesting castings in this movie. Uh, Cindy Morgan, who a couple years before this was in Caddyshack, mm-hmm. and uh, Bruce Boxleitner, who after this later on would become Captain Sheridan on Babylon 5. Mm-hmm. And then uh, this is the sad part of my review, but we just this guy just passed away last week. David Warner, yeah. one of my favorite character oh. actors of all time. Um, passed away and it's so sad because he is in so many great movies oh yeah and he's just the concept i mean you mentioned uh he was teenage mutant ninja turtles mm-hmm. too too he was in that he was in this he was in the omen he was in time bandits he was in a couple of star trek movies uh the omen time after time he's so many great movies so the man with two movies. brains <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so such a great actor and i never got to meet him the closest he came to me was like las vegas but were you at least closer to Las Vegas than you currently are now? No. Oh. Unfortunately. I was hoping like, man, can't he come to like Chicago or something? Because he did conventions occasionally, but I just never got to meet him. Oh. So. And I have another uh, recent death in the last week, unfortunately, which I'll be talking about in one of my other movies. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's Tron. Uh, underappreciated, I think. I don't mm. think you have a movie like The Matrix without Tron. I really don't. Yeah. And I'm surprised yeah. more people don't make that connection. But, hmm. but anyway, that's my Tron bit. I know that they incorporated Tron into Kingdom Hearts. Really? Yeah. This is a game? Yeah, it's a lot of game. Um, but it's basically Disney and Final Fantasy. Oh. So oh, mixing oh, okay. those two universes together, sure. and they do include Tron. Interesting. Also, do you remember Tron Guy? Tron guy. Oh, he dresses up in the in the thing. Mm-hmm. I yeah, because he came to your theater. Yes. But wasn't he in like a, on like Regis like, and Kathy Lee or something? Yeah, he. I I think he did like a video, where you like basically put himself into Tron, and that became a viral video and people laughed at him. But pfft. yeah, because that's what you did. To the early viral See, videos. See now that would be but, a huge. Now if he did that, now that'd probably be a huge TikTok. Oh thing. yeah. Definitely. So he was TikTok before TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. And I met him. Yeah. I have picture proof. Now how now how <laughs> did he get to you? Um <laughs> when Tron Legacy came out, mm-hmm. yeah. there was uh posts all over the internet saying that his local theater would not let him see Tron in his costume. Why? Lights and being distracting. Oh, the, oh, 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 yeah. okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous, like silly, ridiculous well, What if thing. they make him sit in the back? Or like, give him exactly. like a special reserve seat in the back? So the I, I reached out to him and I, because he's actually um, from Rochester, the Rochester oh, area. Oh, okay, sure. And I was like, you can come see it here. We'll even pay for your ticket. <laughs> wow. So we, we got him to come to, to La Crosse Marcus. Nice. Mm-hmm. Wow. So you can watch so, Tron with Tron yeah. guy. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Mm-hmm. All right. Are we on to the twos? I think we're on the twos. All right, it's time for Aaron's number two <clears throat> selection. Number two is Pink Floyd's The Wall. Mm, really? Number two? Over Grease 2? Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Now, yeah. I'm curious as to someone who is a bit younger than I am and doesn't really remember 1982 much because you weren't around. Mm-hmm. But um, why... Well, what is it about Pink Floyd's The Wall? I love Pink Floyd, just in general. Okay. Like a big fan so you're of like like a, all of the music. You're like second generation Pink Floyd. Yep. Okay. Yep. You. Yep. You can blame my dad for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, I just, I love like just the use of instrument, instrumentation and sampling and like put different levels on things. When you're listening to it, it's just like, all the sound is going directly into your brain, and you like just feel the music. I know that's weird. Well, not, not if you like person. take certain substances. It's not. I hear it's See, a very common but I, experience. I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I still get that. So, 
Yeah, you don't have to be on substances to enjoy Pink Floyd. <laughs> Fair enough. There. <laughs> I, I have done the same thing, so it's... Uh, I've actually seen a, a officially sanctioned Pink Floyd tribute band. Mm-hmm. They're called Brit Floyd. Nice. And I saw them when I was in Colorado. Uh, they played out there at uh, a famous venue called Red Rocks outside of nice. Denver. Um but yeah, would it be safe to would it be safe to say that uh, Pink uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall, much like uh, Bugs Bunny One Thousand and One Tales, is kind of like a two hour music video of The Wall album? Or would you say there's more to it than there, that? Uh, there's more to it than that. Think so okay. I, I I do think that there's more to it than that than that because we should mention it, that it is more. There is an actor in this movie. Well, there's several actors, mm-hmm. but I mean the main actor is actually a guy named Pink. The, he's playing a guy named Pink. Yeah, uh, yeah. who is who is played by uh, Bob Geldof. Mm-hmm. Who, other than this, was did he actually have a band? I don't. He know. was his band was called Boomtown Rats. Yeah, okay. They yeah, had yeah. a song called "I Don't Like Mondays," mm-hmm. uh, which was about a school shooting, but that's beside the point. Yeah. Um, and he also mm-hmm. put on Live, Live Aid. Aid. Yep, I was gonna say so. he's probably. Mo- thing, he's most known for Other the than this, he's flat, prob- most people flat. would probably know him for Live Aid because mm-hmm. uh, he organized that. And do uh, you know who played him in the Queen movie? Not that it's important. Um, if any, one of any significance. I can't think of Someone who did. was. Because there was yeah, a Bell Gelder. He was there, but I don't remember who it was off because the Because the Queen was on the stage and the phones at the mm-hmm. the Pledge Center were kind of dead, and all of a sudden they started lighting up like crazy. Mm-hmm. And then blah, 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 blah. You know, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I got. I can't remember who okay. that was. Well, anyway. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, the that's a really nifty. I don't say. I don't use that term with Pink Floyd a whole lot, but it is a nifty album. Mm. Uh, and there's all these. You see a whole, like the surviving members of Pink Floyd. What how horrible their childhoods must have been. It, it was because it's mainly just Roger Waters because yeah. this is a semi autobiographical story of his yeah because he grew up as in much kind of as that, he can yeah tell <laughs> and uh because after all um how can you get your pudding if you don't eat your meat pudding just means dessert <laughs> well still <laughs> yeah I'm getting wrapped across the knuckles by horrible oh, teeth i mean i can't imagine teacher. what that would have been like, it just, like it, it's it's hard to to imagine you know being a child in the in the 50s in Britain. Yeah. Oof. And if you want to, watch Pink Floyd's The Wall. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And some... Cr- Where and they turn you into mints. Speaking of animation, there, uh, there are some nifty animated sequences mm-hmm. in this, too. Like the marching hammers. Yep. And the hammer kind of walkers. The um, birds turning into bombers. Oh, uh, yeah. Everything done beautifully. Actually, oddly by... enough, it's a little bit like heavy metal. Similar, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Less excessive nudity, though, but <laughs> but still there. <laughs> yeah, more symbolic in this case. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so as opposed to gratuitous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's but, no robot smoking cigarettes or anything like that. No, 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 no okay. not in this one. All right, no. Pink Floyd, the wall. Mm-hmm. Because you don't need no education. <laughs> or do you? Um, is it my turn? Sure. Uh, this is two? Yes. Okay. My number two selection. This is really hard to come up with a pecking order. Well, I knew what my number one was going to be. But mm-hmm. everything else was kind of a hodgepodge mm-hmm. for me. So, But I decided to go with a... Not really an underdog story like it used to be. But it's more of a comeback story. But I went with Rocky Three. Um, and when you wa- watch either this film or Rocky IV, which features Dolph Lundgren, mm-hmm. I must break you. Um, <laughs> there's a very clear demarcation point. There you have Rocky's one and two, mm-hmm. and then over here you got three and four, where Rocky is almost like he's two different people. Mm-hmm. Rocky's one and two. He's very much hey, I'm from the streets and. 
you know, I'm gonna hang out at the pet shop and I'm gonna throw my ball against the wall and pick up the turtles and all that, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Where here it's like, he, after the first two movies, he gets hit in the head so much, it's like he almost kind of got smarter. <laughs> he dresses more differently. Mm -hmm. He speaks more cleanly. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't sound as stupid. <laughs> and it's like he's, He's like a completely different person, mm -hmm. you know, in these other two films. But it's Rocky Three, yeah. He, it, at the end of Rocky Two, of course, he does the impossible. He becomes a heavyweight champion of the world, and then you see all these little uh, this vignette of like some of his other uh, matches against people, which he seems to be winning rather handily. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see that some of these fights were kind of, you know, they're kind of softball not to use another sport, but they weren't really challenging for him. Mm -hmm. They're just kind of there to make him look good like the champ and blah, blah, blah. Well, out of nowhere, when he wasn't pitying fools, he came out uh, Mr. T, or as in the, he's known in this film, uh, Clubber Lang. Mm. Uh, and he's kind of means business and says, hey, you got something that I want here. And uh, you kind of, it's strange because he doesn't, Rocky doesn't really... He he doesn't like this guy, but mm -hmm. at the same time he doesn't he doesn't want to do it anymore. He kind of wants to be done with boxing. He wants to get on with his life, but he's kind of you know just just do one more and this will be it. And then well, it, you could tell he wasn't in it because he spoiler alert he loses the fight mm -hmm. and he's he's kind of and that's kind of down. It's not only that, but his manager played by Burgess Meredith he passes away. Mm -hmm. um, and he's just kind of, he doesn't really know where he is because he's kind of lost his pride. He's lost his passion for doing this. He doesn't really know where he is. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people can kind of identify with that where they're like in a place where like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing here? Why am I still doing this? I should be doing something else. But I can't, getting that to uh, reconcile with like my professionalism they don't always go together. You know, right. I, I'm obligated to do this thing, but I don't want to do it. And then an old face walks back in. Someone who used to be his opponent says, hey, what's going on, man? You were better than Dude. this. Yeah. What's up? You, I had to work to beat you, and now you let this guy come and just beat you like you're nothing? What's go, What's up with that? What's up with doesn't that? make look you. It looks, make, makes me look bad. It looks us look bad. It looks <laughs> all of us look bad. Everybody looks bad. Yeah. So he says, you you got to do better than that. And so he kind of picks him and back up and dusts him back off and gets him back into shape and says, here, go do it. And if you lose, you, you lose going out in flames. But he, he, hey, spoiler alert, he won again. So... Yeah, it's just kind of a great, it's a, com, you know, it's not a underdog. The first two Rockies were definitely underdog films. This is very much a comeback film, I would say, because yeah. everybody loves a comeback, oh, I yeah. think. So, yeah. yeah. But my favorite thing, <laughs> one of my favorite things in the movie, uh, before the fight at the end, they're asking Clubber Lang, mm -hmm. uh, they're interviewing him about what's going to happen in the fight. And he said, the reporter says, what's your prediction for the fight? He looks back at him. He says, prediction? The reporter says, yes, prediction. He looks at the camera. He does this little thing where he licks his lips and he says, pain. <laughs> That's probably my favorite moment in the movie. It's just so fun. It's just so cool. And this is bef I don't wasn't sure if this was before or concurrent with his debut on the A team. But before. They, this was before. We couldn't it's got it had to have been pretty close yeah. though. I would say he may have been filming there yeah, when so, this came out. Yeah, it's but quite A team. It's quite amazing A3. that Stallone found him. When he did, because he's mm -hmm. he, he kind of steals the show. Really. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. His, uh, yeah, I love. Yeah, it's a great movie. I just I just love it. So, although Siskel and Ebert weren't fond of it because he wasn't stupid Rocky, mm -hmm. you know, because stupid Rocky is more endearing, where he's more you know, you know, high mm -hmm. society Rocky. So they they that kind of lost some points with them. But I, I still think it's a great movie. So, 
Could could three and four be fever dream Rocky caused by brain tumor? You know, that's an interesting theory. Uh, and then, but they never re reconciled that in the later films, though, which would have been interesting. Yeah, would have been. But that's not that's not really what these movies are. That would have been a better like raging bull thing <laughs> with De Niro. He mm -hmm. wakes up later and like, ooh, this is a oh, big dream, okay, you know, cool. or whatever. But uh, <laughs> that's my uh, that my number two. Nice. Uh, we gotta move on though. Mm -hmm. uh, your number one film. It's okay, we don't have to talk about my number one film for very long. Yeah, because, because my number we, one film well, I, of '82. Yeah, and just to give a hint, we have talked about this film in a previous episode. <laughs> Yep, my number one film of 82 is The Last Unicorn, because it is my favorite movie dun, 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 dun. of all time. So, and it came out in 82, yeah. and if it goes on to any of the lists that we um, put out and it happens to fall onto that list, it will if be it my meets, number one If it movie. meets the criteria, it's yeah. going to be on the list. That's yeah. just how it is. It's okay. just how it is. All right. If we have a list that is movies that are kind of musicals with music from America... This will be number one. And another fun fact, <laughs> uh, this is the second movie of this show uh, to both have, to have Jeff Bridges mentioned mm -hmm. twice. Because mm -hmm. he is a voice in this film. Yep. Yeah. In the same year. Prince Lear. Mm-hmm. Now, has there ever been a, has anyone ever tried to remake this film? There have been many talks about a live action remake. Now, this is not a, but this is not a Disney film. It is not. So, who would make it? Oh, uh, whoever currently owns the rights to it. I think, I think it's Columbia. Columbia. Columbia Tracer. Okay. Uh, which would be a Sony project. Um, but I am not entirely sure who currently owns the rights to it. But I do know that if they do make a remake of it, uh, Peter S. Beagle will be there going, no, you're telling it wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, is he still alive? <laughs> yes. He is? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to know with some of these properties that go on forever if, like, the originators still exist or, mm -hmm. or not. Um, but just in case people may not have seen the last episode, perhaps a quick synopsis is in order. Ah. Uh, well, uh, Mia Farrell is the last unicorn. Um, because all the other unicorns, something happened to them. So she goes on a, a journey to find her brothers and sisters, and along the way she meets a bunch of people and then gets turned into a human and falls in love um, with Prince Lear. And then she's the only unicorn to ever have human emotions, and it's sad because she knows what that is, but it's going mm. to be lived forever. And, yeah. Yeah. So she is truly the last. That's it? That's it. It's okay. my favorite movie. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I'm sure she talks about it more on the... Our, our, uh, non Watch the last episode. <laughs> on, yeah, the non-Disney animated <laughs> episode. Uh, so is it to me now? Yes. All right. It's your uh, number one movie. My number one film uh, is actually a number two film. <laughs> Uh, but it's number two in a series. It is Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. And I saw this movie in the theater when I was five years old. <laughs> I knew nothing whatsoever about Star Trek except that it had a guy with pointy ears in it. And, and my mother said, I'm going to take you to the movie this afternoon. It's kind of like Star Wars. I think you'd like it. <laughs> Awesome. And <laughs> he, if I had known then what watching this film would do to me for the rest of my life, yeah, yeah. Um, wow, and kind I kind of shaped your being, huh? Yeah, and then like, <laughs> there's so many movies that when they come out, you know, and they're huge hits. I mean, look at like any Marvel film; mm -hmm. they make. Their money and money, but of course, movies are different now because they kind of make their money and then they're out of it. They're out of there. Like, how much money did Avengers Endgame make in the theater Oof. or Avatar? You know, like too much. Yeah, but then, the, but some of these movies, those will, I think those are going to be talked about for a while. But something like you know, Thor: Love and Thunder. I mean, mm -hmm. are people going to care about that thirty years from now? People aren't caring about it right now. <laughs> But I mean, and... Top but, Gun Maverick is doing better numbers than 
or yeah, I'm, that, I, I'm, I'm really surprised the about for that. Two months. Well, see, that's a movie that didn't have anything going on for like 35 years, and people kind of, oh, I I remember the first one. I'll go see that because there hasn't it's been like, tons. I remember it's the first It's not like where one, Disney we'll makes tons. It's the exact same Like movie. where one series gets done, they already have the next one ready to go. Mm -hmm. It's just the pipeline. And I, Star Trek II is like one of those movies that it did very well. It actually was the opening weekend record holder wow. when it came out uh, until Return of the Jedi the following year, I believe. And it's a movie that, and you can see why it's beloved because it's a movie, as someone who I've aged with the movie, mm -hmm. it just keeps getting better. When you could, because you see, it's kind of sold as you know the wrath of Khan and like big whiz bang and mm -hmm. outer space and zap zap boom boom and all that. But you see the subplots in the movie, like why? What am I gonna do with myself when I'm fifty? You know, do I reconcile myself to having a child that wants nothing to do with me? You know, the ideals of friendship. You know, I have been and always shall be your friend things like that um moral quandaries do we have the right to use this to make new life or will it destroy you know it's just mm -hmm. such there's so many ways to peel the onion in this movie and it is kind of like an, uh, an onion because at the end it will make you cry at least it did for <laughs> me and it still does um but basically it, and i knew nothing about star trek when i first saw this but it relates to something that happened has its origins in the television show. Mm -hmm. Ricardo Maltabon played this guy who was the leader of a group of people. He tried to take over Captain Kirk's ship. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't quite work out, but Captain Kirk was a nice guy and said, hey, here's a planet over here. We'll let you off since this is off the record. We won't tell anybody about it and you're free to do whatever you want. Well, time goes by. Something happens where instead of an ice age, the planet has a sand or desert age okay. and everything just gets covered in sand and he's kind of mad about that well he wants to make his wrath known i guess you could yeah. say and along the way he finds out about this thing called the genesis project and uh i see i'm running out of time so i kind of have to <laughs> i have to wrap it up but anyway <laughs> it's it's a fantastic film and this is the reason why i hate star trek into darkness okay <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, okay. I guess we're not going to have a ton of time for... Do you have any quick honorable mentions? Mm, we should probably mention E.T. again. Yes, I was going to get to that. I have a list <laughs> here. Conan the Barbarian, Poltergeist, mm -hmm. uh, Megaforce. I don't know that one. You like South Park? Mm. Team America, World Police? Mm -hmm. That's basically Megaforce. Okay. It's Thunderbirds? Well, and Thunderbird. Well, Google Megaforce. You'll, oh, you'll see yeah, what I mean. Uh, the Secret of Nim. Mm -hmm. That's our timer. Uh, I got to wrap this up pretty quick. Friday the 13th, Part 3. Oh, yeah, the best one. Yeah, the 3D one. <laughs> ha Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. That one was the best one. Uh, First Blood, another Sylvester mm -hmm. Stallone film. And uh, uh, Stephen King, George Romero collaboration, Creep Show. Yeah. Those were all in 82. And I'm sure there's others that will miss them. Mm -hmm, but, uh, mm -hmm. Wow. Do we get them all in? I think so. Okay. Well, that's all. That's our flick list for today. Until next time, I'm Drew. I'm Aaron. And uh, keep those lists handy, and we'll see you on the next one.